Hello, everyone. Uh, this is another episode of Unisoft Law YouTube show, and uh, I'm really glad to have one of my past guests here today again. Uh, uh, he was kind enough to accept my invitation to return to uh, this show. His name is Ian Hu. He's right here, and I will just let him uh, give a brief intro uh, into himself. Uh, he probably did it. He did it already before in the previous episode. Let him do it again. Hi, all. I'm uh, currently a, a civil litigation and estates lawyer at Carroll Hay Chown, and I've done uh, a bunch of other things before that. So uh, look me on, look me up on LinkedIn. I'll add you. And you know what? I opened your LinkedIn profile uh, before this interview, and I just want to quickly tell the audience that you studied in three philosophy programs before law school. Uh, you went to uh, Western, where you got your honors BA with distinction in philosophy. You uh, got your master's in philosophy from U of T. And you also uh, uh, studied for a PhD degree in philosophy in Rice University in the States, in Texas. So you were really serious uh, about philosophy, obviously, but then law I, uh, must have tempted you away from philosophy. And uh, you practiced law since 2008. So you are past the 10-year mark. And you cannot be referred to as a junior lawyer anymore. Congratulations, Ian. Thanks. <laughs> I know that this is, this is a strange profession. If you're under the 10-year mark, some people f consider you a junior lawyer, right? You're not anymore. So good for you. Yeah. But this interview is not going to be about philosophy, at least not directly. This interview uh, will be about money. And uh, the reason I want to talk to you about money is because you founded a face group. I'm sorry, you founded a Facebook group about money for lawyers. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Ian? Thank you. Yeah, it's called Canadian Lawyers Personal Finance. And we have about 800 uh, members now. Every day it's growing, it seems, um, to the point where, you know, it's... Uh, I grow 10% every month, it seems. So I expect it to double by the end of the year. Um, and it started because uh, my wife is a physician and the physicians have 20,000 members on the Physicians uh, Financial Independence Forum. So I thought the lawyer should have one too, damn it. That's a good enough reason uh, as, as any. Uh, and uh, Besides rivalry with your wife or with doctors, not sure which one it was, have you ever, have you always had particular interest in money? And I'm not talking about like everybody is interested in money, of course, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, it's an interesting question, Pula. Um The answer is no. And uh, I'd never gave it a thought until, and, and I've only sort of recently realized this by looking back. Um, I was studying philosophy and, and PhD and, you know, I was funded by the program and I had, you know, a little bit of student debt, mostly because tuition was low in those days. Um, and uh, one day I realized, it, it might not be one day, but, but I came to realize that I would never be able, as a philosophy professor, um, probably not a tenure track philosophy professor, given how I was doing, uh, ever be able to have a family and um, uh, raise them the way I was raised. And I thought, you know, I can't be going day by day eating rice and, uh, and canned fish every day. You know, that's no way to live. And so I thought um, that's what brought me into law to, to uh, purely um, uh, financial reasons. You would agree that there are different perceptions of wealth. I would say that uh, very few people in Canada are at risk of eating rice and canned fish every day. May, you know, there are, there are definitely people like that and we should be concerned. This is not just 
uh, if we know about people like that, if we know that people like that exist, we should be concerned and society has to do something about it, right? But uh, this is a question of poverty rather than wealth, right? So if I, I, I respect, I respected that your initial motivation was to avoid poverty, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I believe that a lot of people who became wealthy, eventually they started by simply trying to escape poverty, right? But uh, wealth is something else. And in this respect, I will throw out a contention and you tell me if I'm wrong. You can never be wealthy if you're a lawyer, if that's what you do. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, I, I would say you're wrong. I think it's, and it's based on the definition of, of wealth, wealthy that I like, which is basically getting to a point where you are financially independent. And what that means is getting to a point where you don't have to work. So that definition of wealth can be attained by anyone in, in any profession. You just have to uh, spend little enough and save large enough that you can meet your expenses for the rest of your life. So you might reach that at 50, you might reach that at 70, uh, but at some point you're gonna reach, reach that where your savings um, are enough to last you until you die without having to work. Ian, you would agree that to, and I'm sorry for this uh, slightly cross-examination-y style of, of questioning here, it's just a very interesting topic. Uh, you would agree that to meet that standard that you just described, there are two ways. One is, of course, to increase your income, and the other one is to reduce your expenses. And uh, the extreme case of reducing expenses and uh, people who actually meet your standard of wealth are people who live on the street. So, uh, and again, I say that without any uh, sarcasm, and I think that poverty is a real issue. Even when we speak about wealth, we should never forget about poverty. And even in a country like Canada, which is one of the wealthiest in the world, poverty is a tremendous issue, huge issue. But returning to wealth, May I offer another definition of wealth or another definition of the standard of wealth and bounce it uh, off of you and see what you think about it. So this definition uh, that I'm about to offer doesn't concern expenses because your definition is centered on expenses, meeting your expenses. The definition that I want to offer concerns investment. So to me, wealth is not meeting your expenses. To me, wealth is meeting your investment objectives, being able to fund, finance projects that matter to you. And of course, you work because um, uh, you, know, you are passionate about projects, about things that you invest your money in and you work by overseeing them by selecting them so there is nothing like i don't work anymore maybe there is a different definition of work at play here but the standard is not about meeting my expenses the standard is about can i fund things that really are important to me even if they are uh, uh, related to philanthropy even if they are yeah. related to business even yeah. if they are related to politics so yeah. this, is, this is an alternative definition. What do you think about it? Yeah, um, I think you're talking, uh, you're relating money with, with the power to do things. And, um, and that, that's certainly one way to look at it. When I think about wealth, I think about um, your net worth. Okay, so what are your assets minus your liabilities? And if you take your assets minus your liabilities, and um, are you able to support yourself um, until you die? without having to work again. Now, if, if let's say you have zero net worth, right? You take your assets, you minus your liabilities and you're, and you're left with zero, but you make a million dollars a year in income. You have all the power that you're talking about, right, Pluit? If you're making a million dollars a year in income and you're spending, you know, and let's just call this after tax income, and you're spending half a million on the charity that you wanna run, 
and the other half a million on on the Lamborghini that you drive and, and the and the sailboat that you want to race and all of that um, then you have power right you have you can you have power with your ability to make income the, the problem there though is uh, what if you're sick what if something happens to you what if you have a family well the second something happens to you uh, you're in debt and you, you may very well be in very deep debt very, very quickly. And so I, I don't view that as, as, um, as wealth worth having. If you define worth wealth in terms of the, the income that you can generate and the power that you can have by spending that income, because um, you, you don't actually have power. What you are is you're chained to these, uh, these um, projects that you have. You're chained to these goals that you have, and you're chained to your your in, your income-producing job. The second you stop producing that income, you lose all of the things that you love, and that doesn't seem to me to be a, a good place to be money-wise. Interesting. Let's talk about some specific examples. I know that you worked on personal injury for years. How do personal injury lawyers make money? And I'm not talking about you specifically. You don't have to talk about yourself. But I know that you understand the industry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, most personal injury lawyers make money either, probably I would say by contingency, which means you settle a file. For, well, a, a person gets hurt. They come to you to, to sue the, uh, the person that did the hurting um, for pain and suffering for the care that you're gonna need for any loss of income. And then you resolve that file usually by settling it um, and very rarely by going to trial. And then you get a percentage of that settlement. And that's how most personal injury lawyers make money. Uh, some of them uh, are do make money on, a, on an hourly basis. So they just bill like any other lawyer. Is it easy to make money as a personal injury lawyer? I would say these days it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of, of competition. Um, it's not like it used to be. The insurers are, uh, are um, uh, better supported. They have their own legal teams in-house. And uh, the public has um, in some ways turned to, uh, toward a, a healthy amount of skepticism in regards to such files. You know, to me, wealth is about scalability. Let me explain. So this is connected to my original statement where I put it to you that lawyers are never really rich. So to be rich, you need to be able to leverage some kind of scale, right? For example, you sell a product that potentially millions of people can buy and uh, this added value uh, on this product gets multiplied by a potentially an endless number of purchases, right? So this is scale. A lot of wealth in the world was created by using scale like that. And uh, if you sell service and specifically your own service, basically when you sell time, the, the, the scale doesn't exist because there are only 24 hours a day. Although I've heard stories of lawyers billing more than that but it's extremely rare. <laughs> so, um, so well, the, with business, the business model there at Poulet is to, um, is to uh, hire people um, to do the young, young lawyers to do the work for you. Then you, you get a chunk of their billings. Right. That's absolutely right. But uh, I would submit that even that is not scalable compared to selling uh, Coca-Cola cans, for example, right? Or something like that. So how many young associates can you really hire? And also with every associate you hire, you increase complexity in your organization because you scale by adding human beings and you scale, yes, we can cover that with insurance, but at some point, you know, people uh, make mistakes, people leave, there is attrition. And uh, even one associate, even a young associate cannot bill more than I would say 14, uh, hours a day. I've heard of, of people who uh, bill um, in that range. And even the biggest firms in the world have only thousands of lawyers. So this is a very different level of scale. 
And besides, if you have a huge firm with hundreds of lawyers, um, you also have hundreds of profit sharing partners, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I mean, whenever you scale something, you have other problems, right? But it, it is scalable. And, and one thing that lawyers have an advantage of is the monopoly. So since you have a monopoly on the services, your margins are high. And so you can, if, even if you're unable to scale uh, by a thousand lawyers and, and there are law firms that are that big at the same time, um, your margin is so big that, uh, or can be large enough that you're pulling in um, very high income. Very interesting, but how do you get that income in the first place? Can you give me some examples, your favorite examples of successful lawyer marketing? I mean, you've had a long career already at, by, by now. Sorry, I just got my kid here. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, certainly we, we all know about some firms that do a lot of uh, radio and, and television and marketing and sports arenas. And uh, they, you know, they certainly seem to be able to draw in a lot of clients, right? If you can draw in more clients than you are able to do yourself, then, then you can scale simply by adding another lawyer. That's right. And I'm observing an interesting pattern here to achieve even that level of scale that you are advocating for law firms as possible, you need volume, you need to draw clients in in large numbers, and then you need to add associates to support these clients. So essentially, I'm, I'm uh, aware of two types of law practices, value and, and volume. So personal injury uh, would fall under volume and uh, commercial litigation but probably under value. <laughs> So it, it, it depends if, if you do a certain kind of personal injury law where you're only handling um, files where there are where people are very, very severely injured. Right. Um, like massive brain injuries or, you know, they become paraplegics, that kind of thing. Um, or, uh, you know, what, 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 what are called baby cases. Right. Medical malpractice cases where you have a young we have a baby that pops out that um, may not have been uh, uh, properly cared for, um, then that you're looking at huge damages for each file. And so you only need to carry 10 to 40 files. And those, those are on the, uh, what, what we're calling the top end of value, right? Whereas others, others will have volume practices where you'll have 100 to 300 files. Um, because the value is, is small. So there's room in personal injury, and I think in law in general, for, for um, volume or value. Interesting. So uh, then this pattern does exist, volume versus value. Would you say in your experience, commercial litigation falls under value and it's, it's sort of harder to have a volume commercial litigation practice? Um, yeah, because of ability to pay, right? In, in commercial litigation, you're, you're usually looking at companies that can pay you. And uh, if, if the value of the dispute isn't large enough to be worth disputing or worth paying a lawyer for, you're not going to see it. So a $50,000 dispute, you, um, you know, maybe people will go to a lawyer, maybe they won't, right? Maybe they'll go to small claims court and do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. 150,000, maybe they will go to a lawyer. So maybe you'll make some money there. And of course, the more complex it is, then the more, more you'll make and so on. Um, yeah, so I, I think it is available. Uh, one thing I do want to say, by the way, Poulet, is uh, there's often judgment amongst, uh, I think, in, in our community about whether you are a volume lawyer or whether you are a lawyer that does uh, you know complex high value work, and I and I think that's a judgment that um, is best uh, thrown out, because either way you make a living, and either way you can make a damn good living. Yes, absolutely. Now another interesting area of practice that I would say falls under volume, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll be interested to hear what you have to say is insolvency and restructuring work. 
And uh, the reason I say that they charge by the hour, but they, I, I feel that they often know um, how much they will bill uh, for any given restructuring project because of, of the past record, right? And of course, there are only so many firms that get the best pieces of restructuring work. And uh, to me, it seems that in that business and that type of practice, it's really about finding the projects and then your billings are pretty much assured up to a certain level. They often even get charges on properties um, up to a certain limit for their fees. So that's, that's the security essentially, right? It's similar to personal injury work because personal injury lawyers have their fees secured by the insurance company indirectly. I'm not saying directly, yes. but indirectly. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. At the end of the day, they get paid by the defendant, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the day, the insurance company will pay the personal injury lawyer. Uh, a part of the, the money, yes. Costs. So as long as the insurance company is there, personal injury lawyers will invest in experts, will invest in, uh, in their associates, will invest in the support staff, will invest in the file because they know that their business decision is sound. That's how the contingency fees work. It's a business decision to offer a contingency fee and it has to so be a sound need, decision. You need a pot of money that can pay you. It's not gonna be your own client. So you need another pot of money. Right, and uh, today th there are different options to obtain this pot in order to be able to make a business decision to offer contingency fee. It used to be just, you know, traditional sources of financing, maybe your own money, maybe you slowly build up that pot over several years of practice. But today we have litigation funding, which for essentially a cut of your contingency fee will provide you with that pot, right? Yeah, but, but keep in mind, litigation funding is just a matter, isn't, how, isn't necessarily how the lawyer gets paid. It's just about whether you get paid, you, you get some help with your uh, funding up front or you get it at the end. It's just about timing. You either get it at the front or at the end. Right, and some litigation funders, well, I think litiga litigation fund funding implies upfront funding. And then there is adverse cost insurance, which implies insurance against uh, adverse cost awards at the end, right? Against, I, I'm, the, against I, your client, yeah. Yeah, are you referring to, to this dichotomy? No, I'm just saying, um, yes, there's litigation funding, but it's not necessarily to pay the lawyer, right? And, and mm -hmm. even if it was, it would just pay a, a chunk of it. Um, the, the way the lawyer gets paid is, is the, really paid is, is, is um, the settlement at the end by the, when the defendant pays. Yes, I would imagine litigation funding would go towards expert fees and such. Yeah. Yes. So would you say that expert fees are the biggest cost in personal injury cases for lawyers? Well, uh, if you're talking out of pocket money, uh, by far, yes. These days you get expert reports. When I first started, expert reports were two to $4,000. And now they're six to 15,000. The average, the average expert is about $10,000. Just for the report or it includes uh, testimony in court? Just the report. Okay. Just for the sake of our viewers, I have a, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about salaried lawyers. I, I think we've been really uh, chatting about things that are more relevant to owners of law practices. But if you're a salaried lawyer, let's say you're a salaried lawyer in Toronto uh, and uh, on paper, you're making a hundred to $200,000 a year. And then before tax, can you be wealthy? Yeah. So it is hard for lawyers to, to build wealth, uh, in, which is my definition of, uh, high net worth relative to expenses, right? Um, by the way, the number is usually about 25 times. You want about 25 times your expenses. Um, and that's the rule of thumb anyway. And the reason it's hard for us is because we hang out with other lawyers 
and our clients often have more money than we do. And when there's a, there's an expectation that we drive around in, in a Porsche or in a nice BMW, that we wear a suit when we go to work, that we look nice wherever we go. Uh, there's an expectation that we have a certain uh, look and feel. Um, and, and I don't think that, that, and I think that's another expectation that should uh, be thrown out. Um, we, we, lawyers are, are like anyone else, um, normal people. Um, and if we live normally, if we live without our BMWs, if we live without our nice houses and without our private schools and so on, um, then we can build, uh, we can build a, a high net worth. We can get rid of, or to put it, you don't even need high net worth. You just need to lower your expenses. So there, there's two ways which you just discussed offense, which is making money and making more and more money and defense, which is uh, um, lowering your expenses. I think for a lot of lawyers, the offense is hard and the offense is limited. You know, if you're gonna make the, the bulk of lawyers, that you know, they're gonna make somewhere between 100 and 200. Very few are gonna see far above that. But you can control your, your, your defense. Maybe you, you're spending um, 100K of your 100K salary, leaving you with nothing. But if you live on 30 to 50K and you decide uh, not to get that um, condo downtown and you decide to do a little commuting and you decide to uh, buy um, a suit from, uh, uh, a cheap suit from the Bay instead of Harry Rosen, um, then you're on your way. And in the, in the miller next door, you know how much uh, the average millionaire has ever spent on a suit? No. 400 bucks, 400 bucks. So <laughs> the average millionaire, um, in other words, uh, might be someone that you have no idea that they are a millionaire. The average millionaire in net worth might be someone uh, that's next door. Well, the money is so cheap right now. I'm not surprised that a lot of people are millionaires in net worth, especially after the uh, hike in real estate prices mm -hmm. in, in the West, right? Yeah. Yes. So we Even might be... Then, yeah. The book was written before 2000. So it was yeah. before the boom. Um, but yes, these days uh, I would raise the bar higher, right? Maybe it's more than a million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this defensive approach uh, is safer than the offensive approach. It, it, it carries less risk. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say not only does it, is it easier to control uh, and it carries less risk, but I'm also going to argue it's better for your life. It is better for you not to feel like you got to keep up with others all the time. It will make you happier not to compare yourself with other lawyers who are, um, have huge offense, right? You will be less stressed if you um, have less expenses in your life. You will not be worried about losing your job or getting a lower paying job because you can handle that. Your expenses don't require you to get that, a bigger job. So you're gonna be less stressed. You're gonna be happy because you're not comparing yourself with others. And you're gonna be able to focus on uh, what you, what, what I was gonna say should, but you're gonna be able to focus on what you wanna focus on as opposed to what uh, the consumerism makes you focus on, which is your, you have the freedom to focus on your relationships, to focus on your family or whatever it is that you want because you're not busy um, uh, just trying to meet your expenses because you're spending too much. Thank you for avoiding should because there is no professional advice on this show. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, I, I definitely hear you. And uh, what would you recommend, without that being professional advice, of course, to a 30-something, 20-something, 30-something professional or lawyer who lives in Toronto, uh, how do they reduce their expenses? Well, we, we do have people... Uh, that do live in Toronto that are young 
that are doing pretty well on the website on our uh, Facebook group. And I think as a whole, they, they spend very little. Um, I, I speak with, when I speak with young lawyers, I, they often tell me that they have a, 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 an apartment downtown overlooking the lake, Pulet. An apartment downtown overlooking the lake. <laughs> That's well over 1,700, it's probably over $2,000 a, a month now, right? I can't even guess how much that costs. Um, when I was a young lawyer, uh, I don't mind saying I lived at home. I was at home for a couple of years, you know? <laughs> I, um, I lived in a, when I came here and, and practiced uh, in Barrie, I lived in a basement apartment. I didn't live downtown by the lake until um, my income was much higher. And then, and then by that time I got married and so on. So um, you, you have to make choices that, uh, that, that coincide with a value system that is outside of reward. You, 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 I think it's, it's helpful to stop thinking in terms of, I have done something good, so I'm gonna reward myself by spending money. I have a really good job, so I'm gonna reward myself by living by the lake. I settled a big case, so I'm gonna reward myself by getting a nice car. I um, had a huge bonus, so I'm gonna reward myself by getting that, that nice suit or going on that huge vacation and so on. I think that's, that's a way that we often drive ourselves and, um, and there's no need for that. You don't need to reward yourself with money. It's reward and signaling, right? Yes. yes. Or as the, uh, as the authors in the millionaire next door uh, say, it, it's, it's artifacts. Social artifacts. artifacts. Fine. Um, the, Fine. Uh, it's reward and signaling. And your contention is they are not necessary. And not only are they not necessary, they're also harmful. And that's why you advocate a defensive approach, which is reducing expenses. But wouldn't you agree that it's the people with the offensive approach who make this world go around, who invent, who start amazing companies, who uh, begin uh, movements and things like that? Well, that's the argument, isn't it, Paulette? And that's, that's the bigger argument about whether... Uh, um, they would have started that even if the wealth wasn't there. And I'm going to argue that Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates would have started Amazon and would have started Microsoft even if they weren't going even if they were not going to end up having billions. I'm going to argue they were driven by that because they loved it and they had nothing else uh, but to do what they did. I think we're reaching a, a deep, fascinating conclusion here today. If you don't have an overarching idea, if you don't have an overarching mission, such as change the world or change law, right? Or change retail. Don't try to be a millionaire through an offensive approach or don't try to be rich or wealthy through an offensive approach. Instead, control your expenses and reach a comfortable uh, living or life. But if you have an overarching mission, money is no object and you're not going to be doing it for the money. Uh, you're, uh, so, but, but it's funny because when you think about not doing things for the money, um, well, first of all, there's very few Bill Gates and, and Jeff Bezos out there. They didn't do it for the money and they were success very successful. There are others who don't do it for the money and become nothing. And we never hear about them. Right, survivorship bias. Um, but what I'll say about um, the funny thing, if you stop caring about money, right? If you stop rewarding yourself with buying things, if you stop uh, spending, right? You're going to end up saving tons and tons of money. And so the paradox, the paradoxical result of not putting any stock in money is that you're going to become filthy rich because you're going to have such low expenses and such high savings. But isn't it also necessary to love something for that thing to accumulate in your life? Isn't there a general rule uh, 
to that effect in life. You have to love something. And if you don't love it subconsciously, you're going to reject it because some people have philosophical objections to yeah. wealth. Yeah. Or they know. have some... Uh, yeah. subconscious bias because as they were growing up, their parents would constantly use things, say things like dirty rich or filthy rich or something like that. Well, and, and in fact, something that you see is, is um, people that uh, grew up poor and then they, they have a lot of income. Sometimes the instinct there is to spend. Sometimes people that grow up poor and then end up with a lot of income they're the ones that want to do the most signaling because when, while they were growing up poor, what do they see in, in, their, in their rich friends? They saw people driving around in Beamers. They saw people going um, on ski, ski, ski trips. They saw people um, having things that they didn't have. And so to them, being rich equals um, having things, equals signaling. That is what it means to be wealthy for them. And, and of course, you see that with, you know, stuff like the Kardashians, right? Culture, our culture and media repeat the, the false lesson that being rich means having rich things and doing things that cost money. But that's not what being rich means. Being re rich means having a ton of money in the bank. Your money is in the bank. It's not in your car. It's not in your house. It's not in your suit. Your money's in the bank. That's, that's true wealth. And if there was a TV show that talked about millionaires living like real millionaires, it would be very, very boring. Because you just I sit love, around doing not spending. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we started talking about wealth and how to make money and uh, ended up talking about the meaning of life and the purpose, having a purpose and things like that. I guess it always comes down to that at the end of the day. Uh, Ian, do you want to say anything in conclusion? Um, look, for me, uh, build, building wealth is, is about uh, freedom. Okay. If, as lawyers, we all have this freedom. We can go out and start our law firm on our own at any time. We're, if we're unhappy doing whatever it is we're doing as an employee or doing something for someone else. But there's another freedom that you can have. And that's when you have saved enough or are on the road to saving enough um, such that your, your net worth or your wealth exceeds your expenses by many, many times. And, and when you get on that road, you, you feel more and more freedom. You have the freedom to think what you want. And, and I think it's a um, mistake to think that you don't, that, um, that you already have that freedom. Typically you don't, you come home and you're tired and you're exhausted and so on. You have the freedom to do what you want. You have the freedom to say what you want because there's no repercussions for you in terms of money. And, and if you can get to that point or you are on the road to getting to, to that point, it's a very, very satisfying feeling. So for that reason, um, think about your finances and think about how to get financial independence. Well, thank you, Ian, for sharing your thoughts today with us. I love the discussion. I learned something and something to think about for sure. I really appreciate it. And thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Bullet.